You are watching Opening Your Mind. Uh, this is the channel that we have developed for children with communication, language and learning difficulties. And it's really all about the best information to help children to achieve their greatest potential in the best and shortest period of time. I'm delighted to be here today in Dublin to interview um, someone that I've known for many years, um, an excellent practitioner, an expert in his field in the area of biomedical interventions. He's worked with so many children over the years and helped many children and adults achieve their greatest potential. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Goodwin McDonnell. So Goodwin, I have known you for many years and I've seen the amazing work that you've done with so many children. But parents often say to me, when I say initially about going to see you, they say, but what exactly does he do? So can you explain? I know you're a general practitioner, you're a doctor with many, many years experience, but you also, I think, are what we'll call an integrative practitioner and maybe a practitioner in functional medicine. So I'm not totally sure of the terminology either. So I'd love you to explain what exactly do you do? Well, basically, I'm interested in finding the basic cause behind the problems. And what I would normally do is there'd be look at it in such a way that you try and pick out where of the factor that an influence that affect the child's development and development of the speech and language therapy. Normally it would be the standard medical history basically then I would focus on certain areas like the diet, the nutrition basically, then I would look at where could the problems actually be in the child basically. Normally I'd start off basically by checking the house checking the basically and I would look at the actual hair analysis first because that's an easy one assuming that all the bloods are done and there would be special influence with like you'd be looking at vitamin D basically B12 folate and homocysteine if possible the hair analysis is a very good way of working out the bat is the correct balance there for the minerals and also you get the toxic metals okay. now, the toxic metals would be of interest here because quite often you have kind of gut dysbiosis where the flora would needs to be adjusted it's not perfect and it usually leads to some permeability in the actual gut wall the main toxic metals you'd be after here would be aluminium arsenic lead and cadmium that'd be the first easy test and it's a hair sample so no problem for the child. Okay. The next one you'd look for would be an organic acid test, which is a urine test, basically. It's been developed in the States by Dr. William Shaw about 30 years ago. And what you're looking there for is fungal markers, particularly candida ablicans, which would be the commonest one you'd come across. Okay. Associated that would be another organism called Clostridia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then you'd be looking, it's a very good test. These include mitochondrial dysfunction, which is the energy section of each particular cell okay. very common in the children with autism basically or asd then you get a look at basically the b vitamins and indirect measurements of vitamin d mm -hmm. it's a mm -hmm. urine test so again not very traumatic for the children okay great then you go back to the parents to check out where they actually live like is there a problem here with mold and damp in the house again there's a nice urine test for that then where they live, are they involved in pesticides, insecticides, fungicides? Are they close to particular areas where there's lead mines, copper mines, basically? Okay. That would be the basic introduction and testing it actually do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then the results usually come back. They, they have to go to two laboratories in the States, Great Plains Laboratories and Dr. Data. We have a, obviously they're very time dependent. So we have a courier system, all Ireland, all England courier system. They will collect from your door, basically everywhere in Ireland. They guarantee overnight delivery to London. And then within 48 hours, they'll be at the laboratories. Wow. I've been using them for about 15 years. Rare mistakes, basically. Okay. Now, all the, the tests when they get to America will be tested to see if they're actually viable. Okay, great. When they come back, then basically I will receive, I will know when the, the test comes back, I send all the answers <coughs> to the patients. And then I'll actually interview the parents again and they have the opportunity again to bring their child up. But it's mostly explaining to the parents what it is, where we're going, and if they want me to see the child again, of course I will. Okay, great. I mean, you're really looking at all of the pieces of the jigsaw. I mean, what you're describing 
sounds to me is very different from what a general practitioner or an MD would do. So how, where, where is the difference? Can you just, for parents, to explain that the, the additional pieces that you do? Well, the additional pieces would be with the gut-brain connection, basically. And um, we have an excellent laboratory in Cork run by Professor John Crine, basically, who basically, first of all, about several years ago, showed that if you alter the gut, you can change the behaviour of animals. That the studies were done basically on germ-free mice. In other words, the mice have no germs. They reintroduce the germ, basically, and it affects their antisocial behaviour and their anxiety. And then you f clear the bug out, basically, and the mouse returns to completely normal. Uh, Professor John Crime is available on YouTube everywhere, and he's written an excellent book. Okay. I mean, that's fascinating, isn't it? Because for me working with children, for you working with children, to hear that, because so many of the children that I see, whether they're on the spectrum, whether they have ADHD, whatever is going on, so many children now are presenting with significant anxiety, but in addition to that, becoming dysregulated quite easily, um, agitated, irritable, having meltdowns. So what you're describing there is that when something was introduced, when a, when a germ was introduced to the gut of the mice, who had no issue beforehand, their behaviour completely changed. But when that, when that germ was then removed again, they went back to normal. Absolutely. So this, you know, it's one piece of research, but it's really, and there's a lot of research out there, isn't oh, there? There's an, I mean, this was originally done about six or seven years ago, but there's people in America, in, in Caltech University, and then there's a girl in Japan, they've replicated all these, and life has moved on hugely. I mean, also they con they've put the connection between where is the gut brain? Yeah. They know the gut brain comes through the vagus nerve, which is the 10th okay. cranial nerve. Mm -hmm. It goes all the way from the brain right down, and it has its own separate nervous system called the integrated nervous system, which connects the brain with the actual heart, and then all the way down your digestive organ, right yeah. down to the rectum. And basically what they're doing is they know that the feedback comes from the gut mm -hmm. up to the brain, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, the, to the actual vagus nerve, and also the information can cross the blood-brain barrier, yeah. which yeah. the blood-brain barrier can obviously be affected, particularly by candida albicans, which is the fungus that quite a lot of these children actually have. And you could, that's the way they've reckoned that this is how it can be sorted out, okay. from my point of view, basically. Okay, fantastic. I mean, it, it's fascinating, Goodwood. I have so many families, like yourself, that I would see where I'd be concerned about the child's behaviour. I'd be concerned about, I suppose, the way the child is presenting, presenting with speech and language difficulties, maybe find it hard to interact and engage, having very regular meltdowns, all of that kind of thing, maybe behaviour that's very difficult to manage. And people are often surprised when I suggest you know, could be to do with the biomedical end of things, there could be maybe possible intolerances, allergies, toxicity in their system, and I'd like to look at a referral to somebody like you. And, but when they go to see you then, so they're so thrilled, you know, with what they find and the results they get and all of that. But what would you say are the main red flags for parents that they should watch out for that may mean that you or someone like you is who they need to see? Well, the first thing they would look for, basically, is to, is to go back into the family history. Now, obviously, from a dietary point of view, it being in Ireland, there's quite a lot of celiacs here. It's only 1% or 2%, basically, but there's quite a lot of adults and children who have this kind of non-celiac gluten sensitivity. And the, the safest way to find out is just do an exclusion for a short period of time. I mean, I've had several patients who've only gone out the door about a week or two, mm -hmm. and they've the blame on that, you know, my child is starting to do words, yeah. calm down, basically. Yes, yes. And then they've actually done it before they've even got started. Okay, basically. okay, brilliant, brilliant. And is that a big one then, Good? Because I know, um, as you say, so many people are intolerant to the whole gluten end of things. Yeah. And would you recommend that kids, that if there is a concern around the dietary end of things, and particularly if the child is coming up as if they're on the spectrum, that it may be worth looking at a gluten-free and casein-free diet? Well, it's a very good idea, and it would be part of our protocol. And we would start off, basically, by telling the parents, going to the history, find out what's actually there, and then say, look, you know, this is a trial, basically. Yeah. All right, 20 years ago, when we were doing it, it was extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. But now, basically, gluten-free and casein-free foods are available everywhere. And there is no problem, basically, with the calcium, because they've got the almond milk, the coconut milk, um, and you can use the oat milk some of the time. You can use the soya milk as well, but they feel it has a bit of a kind of estrogenic effect. Yes. Uh, so, but there are plenty of it. All the foods are available every single supermarket. Great. 
uh, the only problem with the foods is you have to watch uh, the percentage of fats because the taste isn't very good. Mm -hmm. So they add a lot of fat and they add sugar. So you yeah. just need to turn to over and check here. what's going on, okay. basically. And there's okay. multiple books and multiple cookbooks all about right. gluten-free cooking. Great. Basically. And that's interesting, Goodwin, isn't it? Just a, a number of things there. First of all, there's a lot of gluten-free products out there at the moment, which is fantastic, and, and, and casein-free. And it's interesting, a question that parents all, always say to me is, oh my God, but how, how would he cope without gluten? Or how would he cope without dairy? But as you say, from a calcium point of view, and of course this is critical, that can be, the child can get that from many other types of milk that won't have that same impact on their behaviour yeah. or on how they're feeling in general. So that's fantastic. And also the other factor there is then to keep an eye on the gluten-free products in terms of that there isn't too many fats Absolutely. or sugar. Sugar isn't too high. Okay, okay, fantastic. And basically, if, if, if I was, just as an example, if I was treating somebody, uh, all the protocol would be to go gluten-free, casein-free for three months, if possible six months. And quite often the parents break it and they will see the sudden change in the behavior, yeah. basically. Mm -hmm. And then you would obviously use your know, fish oils, basically, mm -hmm. um, the cleanest ones you can possibly get. And then from the initial testing, you'd actually have their vitamin D levels. Okay. Um, obviously, being in the Northern Hemisphere, our D levels are particularly low, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. So you can supplement and they've got basic drops or sprays, very easy. Okay, okay. Um, where the reference level should be varies hugely I like to get them to above about 100 nanograms, okay. basically. And then that would be the start. And after that, you would, on the base of results, you'd work out which type of probiotics you would actually go for. Mm -hmm. There are mm -hmm. lots of excellent new ones at very good value. There is okay. no problem. And okay. then obviously you'd adjust the diet as required. Okay. And then basically they can always ring back to find out, well, what about this? Can I have this? Okay. Can I have that? Great. And would that be okay, basically? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then basically when you've done that, you would send them away and then you would recheck, assuming that there's either a fungus or a parasite or basically like there's actually mycotoxin, some of the fungus, aspergillus is the commonest here. Okay. Unfortunately, we live in Ireland. A lot of the older houses don't have any DPC. Okay. The drains are making... And people assume that if you just get rid of the damp uh, and then cover it up, but no, unfortunately. And okay, there's an excellent okay. test in uh, Great Plains Laboratory for that. And okay. you don't see what the problem is, but it's basically challenging the children hugely. Yes, yes. Because they're sensitive, often sensitive to begin with. Absolutely. And then yeah. you add this into the equation, Absolutely. it just makes them even more mm -hmm. sensitive. Okay. And there's no red flags for it unless you actually go and ask them where they live. Yes. Like, what's the room like? Is it cold? Is yeah. it north facing? Uh, how old is it basically? Mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. you can say, look, I think it's worth looking at. Yes, yes. I pick one up every six or eight weeks. Okay, okay. I mean, it's really, it's fascinating, Goodwin, you know, when you say about the different tests and the different things to look at. In terms of kind of physical things that parents can see that might be going on with their child, would, you know, diarrhea, constipation, would that be something they should look out for? Well, Different type of that. stool, I mean, unusual should, stool yeah, sample? I mean, in the stool sample, with the diarrhea and the constipation and the bloating, and then if there yeah. are any outside signs of okay. fungal infections, yes. and then quite often you can look at their faces. Yeah. You basically see these kind of dark kind of patches under their eyes, and then they have these kind of wrinkles, kind of Denny Morgan lines. Okay. They're pretty obvious. You can check their tongue. There's no problem. And everyone can see that basically okay. the bloating the constipation yeah. basically yeah. and then yeah. you can often see the skins get a very rough basically yes. and they yeah. have fungal infections anywhere from yeah. their head to their toe basically yes yeah and then you see the way and the way you see it here and the way I see it reflected then in the speech therapy clinic is that they come in exactly like that pale dark circles under their eyes but find it hard to focus and attend find it hard to listen to what someone's saying find it hard to tune into you so that real kind of you know like there's a dark cloud over them yeah. basically and they're kind of coming in and out and you know sometimes they're with you and sometimes they're not foggy brain basically foggy brain. kind of put it down basically. exactly i always ask the parents to take a picture of their faces yeah. so they're able to remember and then go yes. and go back and recheck an old yeah. picture oh, of yeah. say four or five years ago yeah and then the, the answer usually comes out and you can also check the parents yes 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 because of course i mean you know parents can have an issue with this as well they're living in the same house the reason the same diet it's the same you know so yeah no absolutely okay okay no it's fascinating the different tests that you do good with i mean they're just you know they're so detailed obviously you're taking a full history you're doing all of that you're doing all the usual stuff that the, a doctor a gp and md does but in addition to that you are doing this testing if and when required so that's something that a lot of doctors i presume aren't doing 
Well, yes, but I mean, it's slowly changing here now, okay. basically. People are looking at the probiotics, um, the gynecologists are big into it, and a lot of the, the gastroenterologists mm -hmm. are choosing a probiotic, basically. Great. Now, obviously, if you're lucky enough to be able to do the stool testing, mm -hmm. basically, it gives you an idea of where you need to go. And are there any other bacteria in the system, yes. basically? What are the inflammatory markers like, basically? You can do that, basically. Okay. And then you can also look at the, the prebiotics, which are basically the foods that feed the probiotics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's a list, you, you don't need to buy expensive prebiotics. You can also just adjust the foods that works for them, like basically. Okay, okay. And then it's a very easy way of actually doing it. Okay. And all that's available in the stool test. The inflammatory markers are the standard ones that are mm -hmm. used in the hospital, basically. Mm -hmm, and quite mm -hmm. often, if the immune system is really stressed, um, you can actually measure the immunoglobulin mm -hmm. responses in the urine, in the stool test again, mm -hmm, secretory mm -hmm. IgA, which is IgA, which is the, you know, the defense system from your mouth. Okay all the way down to the rectal okay. passage, basically. Okay, okay, okay. All that's available in the stool kit. And basically, there are webinars on the sites which are available to all the patients to go back and reread it, which wow. I encourage them enormously. It said, look, just look at it, yeah. read it, mm -hmm. and then I'll go back over the whole thing. Brilliant. With them. And where would they find that good one? Is that when they have the testing well, done the test, and all that with great things like that? Yeah. They can yeah. go there and see what the abnormalities are. They don't have to understand them, mm -hmm. but they can just see the market that they're mm -hmm. outside the range, either high mm -hmm. or low. And then they can go on their webinars on each section describing everything. Okay. And they're okay. all fully referenced. Okay, okay. I mean, you obviously work with children with all types of, well, children and adults with all types of challenges, and you have done so for many years. What would you say, kind of looking back over the years, you know, people say now about, you know, the really dramatic um, increase in the rates of autism, ADHD and all of that. What, what's your kind of thinking on all of that? Well, I mean, they've, they've, they've done the figures every year and basically in between the period of 2008 and 2018, it's gone from 100 and, 1 in 125, it's now down to 1 in 58 and it's definitely getting more prevalent yeah, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Where it is, I mean, there's obviously a genetic factor. Yeah. Because obviously there's four boys for every girl cows, mm -hmm, basically. Mm -hmm. um, they basically know that different countries have huge rates. Like yes. Japan has an enormous rate. Okay. Europe is catching up. Okay. I mean, and they definitely feel that, yes, there is a genetic effect. They know there's, there's several hundred genes. Mm -hmm, they reckon mm -hmm. there's about 50 at the moment that are strong influences. Mm -hmm. And then there's 100 plus that are weaker influences. Yes, yes. Then you've also got the environment, you've yes. also got basically the pesticides, insecticides and fungicides. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's one part that you, at the moment you can't correct, but they have this new CRISP-Cas10 where they're able to take out chunks of the gene mm -hmm. and replace it with normal patches from other parts, basically. Then you could be, that'll be the first part to look mm -hmm. at. And then you can actually work out where you need to focus the attention on. With the okay. genetics, there's not much you can actually do at the moment, but yeah. certainly you can tidy up the diet, the fungicides, the pesticides, mm -hmm, the insecticides, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and adjust the idea of taking, keeping the sugar to as low as you can possibly get. And okay. you've got the alternatives like stevia or agave, basically. Great. And then it allows you give the child the actual the sensation of the sugar, mm -hmm. which they will all look for. Yes, probably. yes. And they just adjust it in the diet, basically. Great, great, great. Okay, okay. Just something that you were saying there in terms of the whole genetic end of you know, genetic component. I mean, I was reading Dr. Martha Herbert's uh, book, yeah. who's obviously, and you had recommended her to me, The Autism Revolution. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting there. She was looking back at the research and she said, you know, they haven't found one gene no. marker, basically. So she said, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot going on in the environment that we need to look at that um, that is having an impact on these kids. Oh, and, and by looking at all of that can make a huge difference to these children. Yeah, but there is a huge because it's unfold, it's multifactorial. Yeah. So you have to look at it from the family history, mm -hmm. the genetics. You've mm -hmm. got to look at from the environment, yes. the pesticides, the insecticides, yes. the fungicides, basically, and the dynamics within the family. Yeah. And then obviously, if there's a family history, you can pick that up. So you know there's a genetic part. Mm -hmm. As mm -hmm. how much nobody really knows. They're still working away, basically. Mm -hmm. Like it cost them took a billion to work out the human genome the first time around, but they're now down. Uh, to about five or six hundred okay. and you can do the 23 and me there are several ones that are actually known Crikey. and you can see like what are the tendencies with 
the actual yeah. genomic information. Basically. Yes, yeah. It's fascinating, though, Godra, because, you know, both you and I see so many children who, you know, have been told that they're on the spectrum. Um, and um, thankfully, in some cases, certainly, and, and I think in a growing number of cases, they're not actually on the spectrum, mm -hmm. because once they get your treatment, once they get the biomedical end of things tackled in a really positive way, the whole situation becomes much more positive and the child really changes. And that foggy brain and that kind of tuning in and tuning out and engaging and not engaging completely changes. So, I, you know, that's fantastic to see, isn't it? And I think it, it for me and as a practitioner, it really shows how much of it is environmental and how much of it is down to the foods and the intolerances and all of that kind of thing. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and yeah. the thing is, it needs to be multidisciplinary. So that yes. it's like, okay, we've been talking about the biomed, basically. Yeah, that is a factor. It's a small factor, basically. So you need to put, basically, the paediatrician, you need the, yeah. the OT, the yes. speech and language therapist, yeah. and, and maybe the play therapist. Yes. And, and that way, by putting everything together, you can get the best result because no Absolutely. one piece fixes the problem. Absolutely. Okay, if you're lucky, okay, you might get it all go in a wheat one, but yes. that's extremely rare. Yes. And as we always say, you're always looking at all the pieces of the jigsaw. It's rarely one piece Absolutely. that's going to sort everything out. And I mean, that's true with nearly everything in life, isn't it? Yeah. It's, ra it's rarely one, you know, small answer. It is the combination. It's the multidisciplinary team. And as you say, from the paediatrician to an integrative practitioner yeah. like you, speech and language therapist, OT, maybe craniosacral yeah. therapist, if required, psychologist, you know. And maybe the dietitian. And maybe the dietitian, absolutely, yeah. or nutritionist, you absolutely, know. Yeah. So, yeah, no, so it's fascinating. And I think that's, that's what this channel is all about, is getting really good information out there to, to families. Because what I've seen over the last 20 years plus, and I have had the great fortune to work with, with you and people like you who are so ahead of their time, you know, which is just fantastic, that it's the changes that we see with the children, you know, as a result of that. That, you know, when I, years ago, when I worked maybe within the health system and, you know, it was all very kind of um, set in the way that things were done, I wasn't seeing those changes until we started looking at things like the biomed, the sensory integration piece and all of the other pieces. But that biomed piece, you say it's a small piece, I think it's a huge piece. For me, looking at kids, that piece isn't addressed by someone like you. I, I can't. I can really do very little. I can't really go anywhere. Well, it, I mean, the biomed. It's like it's a reasonably restricted area. You can mm -hmm. easily do it, basically, mm -hmm. and you can see the response. Yes. And the thing is, you can converse with the other therapists, and they would say, "Look, okay, now suddenly we've actually woken up in the last two months. Yeah. Basically, yeah. we're sleeping yeah. better. Yes. If we've any excellence, allergies, the gut is okay, yes. the diarrhea is settled down. Yeah. Home is a hundred times nicer. Yes. And they've okay. They all have melt outs every so I down know. every so often. <laughs> but there's approaches for everything, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. What would you advise a family where they're lit, they're concerned, they feel that their child, their the child's behaviour isn't what it should be, the child may be pale, dark circles under the eyes, maybe prone to diarrhea, constipation, or, and their behaviour is a little bit unusual or whatever. What would you advise them to do? Well, first of all, I mean, assuming that they're in school, basically, the special needs girl in the school or person in the school would kind of gear them to where to go. Then they would probably go to the other. If it's a sensory issue, basically, then they would go towards the essential integration team or the mm -hmm. OT. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if it's a speech and language therapy, it'll be picked up mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. HSC. So they will go there. And yeah. then you can decide, OK, we're getting so far. Then you can have a chance to look outside the box mm -hmm. to see mm -hmm. where we can actually go. Mm -hmm. And usually the parents, yeah. there are lots of good uh, Facebook sites where everybody knows about everybody yes. and what they're actually doing. Yes. Uh, and they can bump into the biomed there, basically. Okay. Or some of the practitioners know what's going on, basically. Okay. Okay. And then basically the speech and language therapists, like I you know quite a few of them, basically, they will know because they, their basic symptoms that's, uh, and signs are so obvious that they will say, you need to go to the biomed or you can yeah. basically go back and they go to like the music therapy or the therapeutic yes. listening yeah. and they will say, look, you know, I think there's a bit more going on here. Basically, we mm -hmm. need to dig a bit deeper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. from the functional point of view, for me, that's my argument. I've been doing it an awful long time yes. when I look after adults. So I have a fair idea where to go. Yeah. And the yeah. testing has been rather because for the first 10 years, we were kind of running blind on symptoms and signs. Now we can actually go and check how effective the therapy is, Great. what's the level of whatever the markers are, have we got them in the normal range, and then once they're there, then I'm able to send them back to the speech and language, the OT, the Great. play therapist, uh, or the mute, and then that way then I've sorted my section. I'm lucky mm -hmm. I get the, the easy part mm -hmm. in my corner, and usually it's pretty effective. Now, of course, 
everybody has tough cases. Yes. They go on a long time. But there's lots of new ideas and ways to mm -hmm. actually get at it. And in, mm -hmm. in the 20 years, it's you know, like improved incredibly. Like, Brilliant. And yeah. access to the information, and especially to the guys who've done all their work on the gut-brain connection. And that's like it's exploding in the last 10 years and mm -hmm. it's going to keep going mm -hmm. at an enormous rate. Mm -hmm. So two questions, Goodwin. Who, you know, everyone's looking online now for information. So if someone wanted to find out more about this area, you know, are there specific people that should be looking up? Are there specific websites that you might recommend? Or if they wanted to find somebody like you, where would they look? Well, basically, there's a few of us. I mean, there's, there's a girl in Cork, basically, who does. Okay. I'm actually in Dublin here. There's quite okay. a few people who look at the gut, but don't necessarily look at toward autism, basically. Yes. Usually, okay. I mean, it's on it's on the sites. I mean, okay. basically, there's okay. lots of like Autism Ireland and all okay. the sites that are here. Okay. They will put them that direction, basically. Okay. And basically, your speech and language therapists, I mean, you can go into like either the uh, Lucina Clinic. Mm -hmm. They're really up to speed, basically. Mm -hmm. The pediatricians mm -hmm. know what's going on, Great. basically. So the information is there, but you can go to any of the therapists okay. who will have an idea where to go. I okay. mean, specifically, there are certain books, but there are lots and lots of books now. Yes. You can just yes. walk into the library and you can pick, well, I like this person, basically. I know, I you know. You can have the completely down-to-earth ball medical answers, yes. or you can basically have the whole integrative yes. approach yes. where everybody's included. And yeah. this is everybody. There yeah. isn't one solution. No, I know, you know. I know. And I mean, you've recommended some amazing books to me over the years. I mean, I have to say, Dr. Martha Herbert's book, The Autism Revolution. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that whether a child has autism or they don't have autism, I think if there's any sense that there's something going on on the biomedical end of yeah. things, I think that is a great book to look it at. It is a good book, yeah. yeah. She, she's, that book's out a long time. Yeah. And she's like, she works in, she's in Harvard University. Yeah. And she gives a nice, small not too many big words, mm, easy to mm, read and mm -hmm. well referenced, basically. Yeah, Absolutely, yeah, it's an yeah, excellent book. Yeah. There was another one you recommended by uh, Kenneth Bach, I think, who's a Dan doctor. Is that right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Can, that's a site I actually forgot to mention. Like, okay, Dan, so that's a good site. You can site. just go on to the Dan site. Okay. It's all included there. It's very similar to what all of us do and what Martha Herbert does, basically. Brilliant. The, the only, there's a few areas that basically are not available in Ireland, which mm -hmm. is basically uh, chelation, basically. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. For people who are really interested in it from our point of view, it's not included in our practice and we wouldn't actually do it. Yes. But if someone specifically is looking for it, there are people in the States who can actually do it and supervise it. Okay, okay. Dr. Cave is one of the person, basically, but there are several people who do okay, it. Okay. Unfortunately, in going to the States, it gets very expensive. Yes, yes, yes. That's I the know. biggest problem with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And from a medical legal point of view, we're not, in, we're not in an outgo near it, basically. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. No, but it's good that you mentioned it because people have mentioned it to me over the years and I don't have a full understanding of it. So, you know, and so it, it's good that people hear, well, this is the situation in Ireland in relation to mm -hmm. that. But if it is something that you're interested in pursuing or finding out more about, this is where you need to look. Okay, okay. And just to, just to make it clear for people, the Dan Doctor, so that stands for yeah. um, Defeat Autism Now, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, okay, it. okay, yeah. okay, okay. Brilliant. And that's a very good site. It's very geared towards the parents and the general public. Great. It's perfect great, size, actually. Great. And I know we've talked a lot about autism today, but actually a lot of what we've discussed is true for so many kids presenting with so many things, mm -hmm. whether it be any kind of developmental yeah. challenge really. You Absolutely. know? Yeah. So it's right across and the, the thing board. Is, I'm much happier with ASD. Yes. Um, autism in the past has had lots of bad connotation that the children yeah. are kind of completely deranged. Yes. But in actual fact, by using the spectrum, yes. you cover a large amount, basically. Absolutely. Like, I mean, dyslexia, like we have three dyslexia children. Yes. So, I mean, do they cause any problem? Do they have any problem sleeping night? Like, no, have they gone to school? Perfectly okay. But people have the perception autistic kids yeah. are running around the place all the time. Yes. Basically, they're destructive at home, mm -hmm. disrupt the family. They're yeah. basically... But that doesn't apply for most of them. No, I you know. know. And I most know. of the ASD children can actually finish their school, attain a very good result, and most of them can go to university. Yeah, and yeah. they have special skills because they see the world to totally different perspective to everybody else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they pay extreme attention to detail. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. the obvious examples are most of the IT people, basically, uh, they came up with an idea that everyone thought was crazy and they were, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. And it's so lovely to hear that because, you know, I mean, that's exactly the way I would feel, that there's so much potential for these Huge. children. And uh, parents often come in feeling like there's no there's no hope, there's nothing left. Absolutely. But what you're saying after more than 30 years of working with, with children with who are on the spectrum, who aren't on the spectrum right across the board, that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. There's so much positivity. And there's so much backup in the education now, basically, that you yeah. can actually, once you can kind of 
kind of regulate them so they're reasonably yes. okay then yeah. they have the potential to, to learn to absorb Absolutely. the information and the world is their oyster basically exactly. i mean there are not people like google looking for kids who have yes. got asd and for the goodness of asd kids. they know their routines they have yes. their patterns and yes. they will follow it and if they see any quirks in the system yeah. they're the first people to spot it yes yeah fantastic yeah no it's amazing isn't it it's absolutely yeah right. yeah yeah goodwin thank you so much for right. for meeting with me today it's been so interesting and it's always lovely to meet you and to, right, to see just you again, yes yeah. and always to hear the amazing work that you're yeah. doing so thank you